Father, we thank you once more for the privilege of understanding your truth and sharing what you're giving to us. Bless us as we continue to move into an understanding of what a Seventh-day Adventist really is and who will give the loud cry. Help us now to take another step in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we move along, we're going to have to keep clarifying points because you can't say everything in an hour, an hour and a half. You have to keep adding, adding, adding. And then when you add, eventually the concept will come, but you said, it always happens. Well, yeah, we could only say so much, and now that we've gotten this far, we clean it up, and we can say more, and we are not changing what we said before, but we are adding dimensions to it that weren't obvious. One of the first uh, we have to clean up here is the word, remember, the Sabbath. Now, we said previously that the natural man cannot, by his reasoning, his logic, his natural being, arrive at the idea of the seventh day Sabbath. Because there's nothing in nature, even his own, that will take him there. Now, now he can understand about not killing. Sure, anybody can come to that. Not stealing, yeah, that's not a good idea. And all the rest of them. But the fourth commandment is not natural. The natural man can't get there. He has to have it brought to him. He has to have God tell him. And it can't be just the evangelist going through town. It has to be the Spirit of God. It has to be Jesus himself telling the person about the seventh day Sabbath and what it means. And it's not just about the day. Because our evangelism basically is just telling people that it's which day. <laughs> but doesn't really express what it means, what it does, and how it changes a person's life. I've never heard our evangelists say to people, for example, that if a person keeps the Sabbath from the heart, they will obey all the rest. I don't know if you've ever heard a pastor say that in a sermon. But that is the beginning of understanding what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath is so important. The Sabbath is so important that, that uh, it brings in all the rest and that's a big dose. Now, I had to bring you up to date because in saying all of that, that it's not natural to arrive at the seventh day Sabbath. It is natural for humans through reasoning and logic to come to the idea of rest. Anybody can eventually come up with the idea. So what we're talking about here is not the concept of rest. We are talking about the seventh day Sabbath, which belongs to God. The concept of rest does not belong to God. Every human has that. But the seventh day Sabbath belongs only to the true God. Now, when I say God in this group, I am not talking about the Sunday keeping God at all. They don't know anything about this. We're talking about those who have the true living God. And the horrible thing that we're having to deal with is that most Seventh-day Adventists don't know there's only one true God. They think God is a trinity because that's what the church teaches today. And most people who go to church today were baptized after 1946. They were baptized after 1980. So they're all Trinitarians. They think 
But they're not really Trinitarians because it doesn't make sense. And if you start talking to an honest Seventh-day Adventist, they will start saying, I don't understand the Trinity. You will know you're talking to a true Seventh-day Adventist then. It's the fake ones that say, I know what it is. Well, how can they know what nobody else in the world knows? <laughs> so you look for the, the honest ones who will eventually tell you, well, I don't understand it. Then you know you're talking to somebody you can reason with out of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Okay, so the word rest is not what the Sabbath is about. It's part of it. It's part of it. But the word rest, any person can come to. They know eventually you have to rest. <laughs> so, what did they come up with if they're trying to be religious and they've heard about the fourth commandment and nobody has ever explained it and God has not revealed it to them? They say, okay, the fourth commandment says, remember the day of rest. That's what the natural man comes up with. Okay, remember the day of rest. And everybody can be satisfied with that. If that doesn't work, they say remember a day of rest. And that's okay. Or they would come up with remember to rest. You see, there's something very general about all those. There's nothing specific, nothing concrete, nothing from God. It's what humans come up with. And you might have recognized in the middle of that something that all the Sunday keepers say, keep one day in seven. So now you know that's natural. It's spiritualism. It has nothing to do with the Bible. What we are trying to understand is what the Bible means by the seventh day Sabbath. That's very important because you can't be a Seventh-day Adventist until you are a Sabbath keeper. The real one from the true God. So, this is why I'm glad that there's a movement afoot around the world for people to finally understand who the true God is. That's a beginning. But it certainly isn't the end of the program. We need to understand who the true God is to understand who the true, what the true Sabbath is. And when we become Sabbath keepers, we will become commandment keepers. And when we're commandment keepers, now God can say from heaven, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you can't have the faith of Jesus if you don't have the true God. And the only way you can have the true God is to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Do you see how it all begins to dovetail and fit together? There is only one gospel in the Bible. There are not two or three. There are not alternatives. There are not options. So once we see the seriousness of all of this, it should motivate us to think, you know, we need to be talking to people. Not about doctrines they don't believe in, but about a truth they don't even know about. But first, we have to get the truth. We have to get it. So, I rejoice that we, in our little group here, and those that you're talking to, that we are getting an understanding of who the true God is. It's the Father there's no other one, only the Father. And He has a Son, and we call Him the Lord Jesus Christ. And He also is divine. He has all the attributes of His Father by heredity. So there's no hang-up. There's no problem. The only problems come from Trinitarians that don't know what they're talking about. So let's keep this straight in our own minds. When God gives you the truth, you know what that truth is? It's absolute. So if God has talked to you and you have it, you have something in you that's not relative to anybody's opinions. It is an absolute fact in the universe of God. That's powerful. You have touched bases with God's 
own mind or you could know those things. Because there's only one absolute. It's God Himself. So when you touch bases and you get that absolute, you are something different on this planet than has ever walked around before. <laughs> it's very important that you know who you are and what God is doing in your life. All right. So what we're talking about is remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Don't ever leave out that seventh or you won't have anything to talk about. All right. I wanted to clarify that because I'm not sure that was clear in everybody's minds from the directions we came. All right. So, the general formulas then are just to rest. Now, the thing we want to pick up from that and the Sabbath is teaching us is that natural man always likes to generalize. What's he generalizing from? His brain. He sees things, he puts it together, he generalizes. Now science has taught us all how to do that. They observe and then they generalize. We will at some point later talk about that science really is not real science because it's not tuned in to God. It is science falsely so-called. And the reason it's science falsely so-called is because they're using their own reasoning power and not waiting for the revelation of God because they don't know it. So when man uses his own reasoning power, he's always going to come up with something that's not true. Okay. So, what has science taught us to do? It's taught us to appreciate. That's not a strong enough word. To idolize the intellectuals, the smart ones, the elite philosophers, teachers, whatever. That's what the world does. They bow down to the degrees, to the college, to the doctors, to the... That's where we live today. And we may give a study on that sometime because that's a big subject all by itself. So, these generalizers, these intellects, what are they generalizing about in the field of ideas? What kind of ideas? Do they go to nature and learn from nature? Or do they take what they learned in school to nature and say, this is what nature is saying? Hmm? They're taking their ideas to nature and saying, this is what nature is, instead of saying, wash it, all that education out, let me learn for myself what nature is saying. There's two different approaches to knowledge. And this whole thing is about the knowledge of God. The only way we can receive true knowledge is to go to what is and learn from it. Now, I, I'm going to be going through a lots of ideas because the Sabbath is so big. We haven't begun to realize all this is in there. This comes out of the Sabbath. <laughs> That's why God gave it to us. And He only gave it to Seventh-day Adventists. Isn't that amazing? He didn't give it to the Sunday keepers because they don't want it. He gave it to Sabbath keepers. And those Sabbath keepers are called pioneers. <laughs> the people the scholars think are dummies. The simple-minded ones, the childish ones without degrees, without education. Do you see? Well, I have news for them. God wants us to be children. <laughs> he doesn't want us to be big degreed adults. He doesn't want that at all because it never works. Never. And I can show that historically. All right. So now then, we're starting to move into our ideas for today. The intellect is what's worshipped today. 
And intellects are called intellects because they know how to do abstractions. And how do you find the people you're going to turn into an intellect? When you went to school, did you ever have something thrown in front of you called an IQ test? Uh, what do you suppose they were doing? You could know it back then because it didn't make any sense to you. Well, what do you mean IQ test? Well, that's your intelligence quotient. What's that mean? We're trying to figure out if you're going to be good enough to go to college. To do what? To do abstractions, to theorize, to... What's it got to do with real life? Well, nothing, but... But everybody has to do it because we all bow down to the intellect, the intellectuals, to the doctor's degree. We're all trying to get there in education. Have you ever noticed that educators are not happy until they have a doctor's degree? And now if you start reading the list of our doctors at the Review and Herald, for example, check up on their wives, and you'll see they're also doctor so-and-so. They're not satisfied anymore about being doctors and stuff. Their wives also have to be doctors. It's an interesting thing I discovered one day by looking at lists of our educators. Dr. So-and-so and his wife, Dr. So-and-so. And where are these getting these doctor's degrees? In secular universities. Our problem is not getting better. It's getting worse. And worse, and I just decided now we're going to do about three meetings on this subject later as we have opportunity because this is one of the major problems of advertism today. All right, so we have reached the point of IQ. You know, there are some people who take IQ tests on purpose. Yeah, the IQ tests are between imbecile and genius, <laughs> and they want to know what they said. <laughs> And uh, I have talked to people who are really happy when they score above average on that IQ test. Now they know at least they're leaning towards the intellectuals. <laughs> don't tell me to be, don't bend down to the idea because the prestigious people on this earth today, have you ever looked at uh, the Nobel Prize winners? Who are those people? They are all the people who are moving to the educational circles, who are producing things for the intellects, that are supposed to be doing something for the world. Well, maybe some do and maybe some don't. I mean, it can't all be wrong or nobody would do it. So what we're dealing with here, I'm introducing the subject that will uh, become amplified later, that the intellect is what's gotten this Western world, a modern world, in trouble. We call it now science. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church has fallen right into that trap through our school systems, through the seminary, through whatever you want to name. We're there with the rest of the world. We have learned to theorize and generalize and get our degrees. And the only thing all these people are free from, you know they're free. They're free from realism. <laughs> the child of the Bible. Now they are theoretical geniuses. And the only prestige in the world today is to be Dr. So-and-so. Dr. So-and-so. And you're absolutely nobody in education until you become Dr. So-and-so. I am not criticizing education, by the way. Education is a wonderful thing, and we're no good if we don't receive education. But it has to be sanctified education. It has to come from God. And that's why the Seventh-day Adventist Church was established, was to educate this world in God's ways and to get away from the worldly element. But we didn't do it. We swallowed the whole thing, and now we're no better than the world in our education. Well, what has the world done to us? Let's be concrete and specific here. 
Let's move from the seventh day Sabbath for just now. We're not really moving away from it. We're just seeing what it embodies. But I want you to see it from another angle within the framework of the Sabbath. Space and time. What do you think about when you think about space and time? Are they two different things? See, I'm going to get into your brain here before too long because we all of us have been tainted by the Mother Church. And we don't realize how much it's gotten into Seventh-day Adventism until we start seeing things like the Trinity. The Trinity is not in the Gospel. It's part of the Mother Church. All right. Space and time. What is space and time? Well, in the world of pure spirit, space and time are no good. <clears throat> the world of Plato, space and time, has to be done away with so you can get into something called eternity. That's paganism. Time and space are different from eternity. And in order to get to eternity, you have to get rid of those. Well, how do you arrive at all that? That's what most people think. That's what ministers and all the Sunday keeping churches teach. Well, how do they teach it? Here's the way it comes out. God created space and time. That's pure paganism. Has nothing to do with the Bible. Or reality. So, if you came in that door and sat down today and you think God created space and time, <laughs> you better go back and start thinking this through because it's another pagan idea that has nothing to do with creation, with uh, salvation or Jesus Christ. All right, that's what we're going to talk about for a while here is space and time and what's going on here. The intellectual is always busy changing reality into myths. Things that aren't. Matthew 3.17 This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Is that reality? How do we know it's reality? God said it. Does God mean what he says? That is the world of realism. The intellectuals come along and say, no, that's not really what that means. Jesus is not the Son of God. He's role-playing. That's pure paganism to talk like that. It has nothing to do with the Bible, but that's what's being taught in our educational system. That Jesus is not really the Son of God. He's a role-player. Paganism. Change reality into myths. Because Plato is only interested in pure spirit. Nothing literal. Nothing you can touch. Just spirit. That's all that counts. And so we, as a people, have moved into the world of pure spirit. Don't have literal things. And with God... Well, which one are you talking about? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You see, when a, a Trinitarian talks about God, you don't know who they're talking about. And they say, well, we're only talking about one God. Well, why do you say there's a God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, nobody does. One plus one plus one equals three. No, that's right. One plus one plus one equals one. How did that happen? One plus one plus one equals one. Sorry. Well, when God makes a command, the God of the Trinity, you don't have to obey. Because what he said is a myth. All you have to do is keep the commandments in the Spirit. 
What you actually do is not important. That's literal. Forget being literal. Just keep it in the spirit. And that's what all the Sunday keepers do. If they keep the commandments at all in their heart, they keep it in the spirit. They don't actually do them. And any minister in the Sunday keeping churches will tell you, we do not keep the literal Ten Commandments. Now, isn't that interesting? I wonder how many Seventh-day Adventists think they don't have to keep them literally. I heard Desmond Ford myself say, God knows who are His. Because He knows their hearts. God knows who are His. And He said because of that, He does not need an investigative judgment. So the Sabbath protects the investigative judgment. Did you ever think about that? Oh, there's so many things going on with the Sabbath. All right. So, if, if you don't have to obey, because it's a metaphor, the commandments are metaphors. I have news for these people who believe in metaphors. Before they understand it, not only would there not be a commandment that they don't have to obey, there will be no commandment giver. Yes, that's where they're headed. And they've already done it. Jesus is not the Son of God. He's a metaphor. Oh, this is bigger than we thought, isn't it? It takes years to get a person to understand the true Father and the true Son. And then after you get that, then you can begin to realize, well, man, where did that take me all those years? Well, it took you some weird places. It's going to take more years to get out of it if we have the time. We have to learn how to become Sabbath keepers. Well, what do the Sunday keepers have then? What do the intellectuals have, and where are they going? They have an invented God. A God that does not exist. A God with three heads is not a real God. They don't want the God of the Bible. Well, they don't want the Sabbath of the Bible, the Seventh-day Sabbath, because that's too childish. To think that a day is important. Come on now, grow up. Be a spiritual person and be be spiritual every day of the week. Keep the Sabbath every day. That's what they teach. Every day is my Sabbath. See, I'm not telling you things I haven't heard. I have talked to lots of people. <laughs> and I've heard every one of these things, and you may have heard these too. It's too childish to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Besides, it's arbitrary. There's no reason for it in nature. So why do it? If God told us to keep the seventh day Sabbath, he was really joking because he made it up. And he was just testing us like Abraham. And when Abraham went to put the knife, God said, no, I just wanted to see if you were willing. All right, I better not get too far into Sunday keeping. I better stay with our subject today. <laughs> because Sunday keeping is spiritualism. We need to understand that. We seem to think we're just like them and it's okay that they're the way they are. Well, if we're like them, we have a major problem. The biggest problem we face is that in being th and doing things their way is we're losing the personal God. There can be nothing personal about the Trinity. But God, the real God, the true living God of the Bible, is a person. One singular person. Me, he, him. You never hear the Bible, read the Bible saying, them. It's not there. Not one verse. He, his. So there 
there's an invented God in this world and it's called the Trinity. I'm saying it's all straight. There's no reason to pretend we don't know the names of this stuff. The seventh day, Sawa, is about obedience to a person. And if you lose the person, obedience is unnecessary. And if you don't obey, it doesn't matter what you say about your religion. The seventh day, Sabbath, <clears throat> is about obedience. Now there is a, a very well-informed person who discovered through his own studies on words. He was an expert in words. That the word elude comes into this. That the people who do not want to keep the seventh day Sabbath because then they will be serving the true God who holds them accountable for the other nine. <laughs> they elude the whole thing. They invent things to say, no, no, just remember a Sabbath. You know, in the Catholic Bible, this says keep the Sabbath holy. It doesn't tell you when it is. Yeah, and that's what the Sunday keeping churches teach. Just keep a Sabbath if you're going to keep one. So then, let's elude this. And we don't need to go through all the arguments that people use for not keeping the Sabbath. That's not our subject today. The fact is, they do it. Now, this word elude, it comes from a Latin word, ludare. And that Latin word means to play. To play. Make believe. Role play. Did you get that? The eluders love role playing. And they put that on the Son of God. Oh, this is amazing where this goes when you start looking at it. Now we remember that God in His reality is always concrete, specific, real. So let's get back to Adam. Was he a real human? Well, the Bible says so. <laughs> Do you know that most of the theologians in the Sunday keeping world believe that's a myth? They say, how can anybody believe the first three chapters of Genesis are, are true? Yeah, they're just stories. They're poetry. They're, they have all kinds of things they say. But no, it's all literal. It's all literal. And do you know why the, the people who don't want to believe in the Seventh day Sabbath say all those things? They believe in evolution. And if you're talking to one of those so-called Christians, ask them a question. When did death come? Before or after Adam? And now they have a bit of a problem because the Bible says the first death was after Adam. Well, then who was killing all those dinosaurs you believe in? It doesn't work. You either have to believe the Bible or science falsely so called. Because what science has become in the terms of origins is philosophy. They have more faith than I have. You know what they believe? That given enough time, anything can happen. Just given enough time. You can make something out of nothing if you have enough time. No, that's absolutely absurd that you can get something out of nothing. But that's what science teaches. At least the evolutionary branch, and that's a mighty big branch. Okay. So, Adam's first full day, what was it? This real person we're talking about, what was his first full day? Oh, it was the seventh day Sabbath. Whose Sabbath was it? It was 
was God. Isaiah 58, 13 says, My holy day. He didn't say Adam's holy day. Adam doesn't have one. God's holy day because he kept it. And you know what? That wonderful six days is now completed. And here's Adam, the only human on the earth. Why do I say that? You know, Seventh-day Adventists are not ready to hear that one yet. I shouldn't say things they're not ready to hear yet. Here's Adam, and here's God. Now, God could have gone back to heaven. Jesus could have gone back to heaven and celebrated his victory with his Father and all the angels. But that didn't happen. The victory was celebrated by resting on earth so that Adam could be part of it. So Adam and God kept holy the first seventh day. So they both were in the victory at the same time. Time. And we see God bending down. That's his glory to bend down. He bent down so that Adam could keep the Sabbath day with him, his day of victory, of the completion. So that was a literal Adam. Was it a literal God? <laughs> a literal a literal person called God. The Father. God the Son. No, not God the Son. The Son of God, okay? Don't ever say God the Son and mean it because it's not true. There is no such thing. All right. So, we have the Father and we have His Son. We have Adam, the completed creation. It says, my holy day. The important thing that we need to understand just here is that man joins God in his holy Sabbath. Man joins God. Now there are six days. What do we call them? They're not the Sabbath. What do we call those? They're just common days. <laughs> They're just common days. The Sunday keepers don't believe that. They say every day is the same, including the Sabbath. Well, if there's no special day called the seventh day Sabbath, and they're all common days, then that takes care of the Sabbath. There is no seventh day Sabbath. They're all the same. Monday is a, a holy day. Tuesday is a holy day. Wednesday, but that's not what the Bible says. Only one day out of the week is God's holy day. The other days are common days. So what God is doing here, and we can't spend time with this, we've got too many places to go, the six common days and the one holy day by God are joined together as one unit. Seven days to make a week. So this is another important element we don't have the Sabbath out there and the six days out there. God joins them together and one stays holy. All right, let's move on here. By the way, if there is no common day, then there's no, no blessed day either. You can't have a blessed day if there's no common day. <laughs> All right. So now we see the word prestige to the world means intelligence, intellect, high IQ, all these things. Doctor's degrees. You know, I shouldn't get into some of these areas. I just mentioned this. I don't care where you get to the people who have swallowed this. They're always climbing. Yeah, they're always climbing to get someplace. It's always higher. Where's the highest? It's more money. It's more. It's better position, power. 
in uh, the universities, it's the chair. They can't be teachers in a department. They want the chair. And they're waiting for that guy to be bumped on or go someplace else so they can take the next step up. And by the way, it's a horrible situation because to climb up, you have to not care about the others who are already there. And there are lots of things wrong with it. Usually you climb up on somebody's shoulders. <laughs> you use people to get there. I better not say any more. I'm feeling a study on that already. Let's leave that alone for right now. Prestige, we see, is that, that system of intellectualism where you're always reaching up. And if you don't go up, you can't go down, by the way. Because in religious systems, they never put you down. When you're doing a bad job, they give you a better job. They just want you out of that place. Have you ever heard of a conference president becoming just a, uh, a pastor again? Where does he go? He goes to some other department in the church. But you think about that. The teachers do the same thing. The teachers never go down. They always go up, even if they're not good teachers. If you have to get rid of him and move him, you never knock him down. You push him up. We'll, we'll come to some of these things. I know there are people who hear this and start screaming, but no, that's the way the system works, and they better start understanding. Uh, so prestige, instead of being that system of Satan, Prestige we see coming from God is bending down to Adam to keep the seventh day with him. That very first seventh day, Adam got to keep it with God. So God is displaying on that seventh day, downness with him is prestige. Helplessness with God is prestige. That's the normal position of a creature. <laughs> we all are helpless. And God doesn't leave us there. He comes down to us as the Father to lift us and to bless us, to have us join Him in His victory of creation. See? You think about some of these things. Meditate upon them. See what you come up with. So then, what we're talking about here is love. And I didn't bring my my Bible with me. Okay. What we're talking about is love. The only true love there is in the universe, God says there is no other love but mine. He said that Several places in the Spirit of Prophecy. Let's see, what am I looking for? Peter. I'm looking for Peter. First Peter 5 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. So that system of intellectualism is not in the Bible. God says he gives grace to the humble. To the ones who submit one to another. Who is the humble one? God himself. So our quest is not to keep reaching up higher and higher and being ambitious and more money and more power and more position. Our quest is to go lower and lower until we become humble like God himself is. Now, I have never seen that in any religion. And when I say any, I mean any. But it's biblical. Sabbath keeping. 
First John two twenty two two twenty four. No, I don't want to go there. Those those are the ones I like. First John four 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 two. Okay, that's the one. We want to see what the Bible is saying about these things. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Is, is it in that intellectual system? Or is it someplace else? Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. But did Jesus come in the flesh? Where did he come from? He came from heaven. Yeah. Do you know that the Trinity does not allow that thought? The Trinity says that God is inseparable. Jesus didn't go anywhere. Yes. Well, you have not been talking to real Trinitarians. You've only been talking to Adventist Trinitarians that don't know what the Trinity is. A, a Trinitarian who understands Orthodox Trinitarianism, going back to Constantine, believes the Trinity is inseparable. And our scholars know that because they have written it in the Bible Research Institute papers. I have it in my little apple. The quotes that say God is inseparable. That's Roman Catholic. But that's what the scholars teach and know. And they know the people don't know those things. The members don't know those things. But they know and that's all that's necessary. Because intellectualism says only the big shots get to know the real thing. Forget the people. They're too dumb to know this anyhow. It's too technical. That's Whedon's term. We will not get technical with you. All right. So it says, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, what did Jesus call Christ in the flesh? In First John, all the way through it. In this chapter, as a matter of fact, in the next chapter. What does he call Jesus? Verse 20 of chapter 5. We know. We know that the Son of God is come. Well, that's what John knows. So, John says that Jesus has come in the flesh. He says it in First John. He says it here in John 4. He says the people that don't believe Jesus came in the flesh is Antichrist. And then he says who that flesh Jesus is. He says he's the Son of God. So he says if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, you are Antichrist. Now that's a big dose for a lot of people that get down one day. Christ is all about love. What they're saying is God does not bend down. Jesus did not really become a human. He's not really the Son of God. It's all role-playing. Well, I have just introduced you to the subject of the Incarnation. If Jesus did not become flesh, you don't believe in the Incarnation. And if you don't believe in the Incarnation, John just says that's what the Antichrist teaches, that Jesus did not come in the flesh. He was not incarnate. He stayed in heaven with the Father because he's part of the Trinity. No, Jesus did come. Literally. Factually. And he not only came, he came all the way down. As far as down as he could come. He didn't just become a human. He became 
a poverty ridden human. <laughs> he became a human everybody could spit on, tear out his hair, put nails in his hand. He went all the way down and learned obedience to the things he suffered. Let the human race kill him. And he was faithful unto death. He came all the way down. Literally. And intellectualism is trying to take that Jesus away from us. And most of them don't even realize this. They have no idea how they've been locked into spiritualism. And the first sign of it is if they think they're Trinitarians. Well now, we have a problem when we read the Bible. It came from Greek words. And the Greek words that are in the Bible are the same ones the philosophers used. But when God uses those words, they don't mean the same thing the philosophers meant. But they're the same words. We get into that when we start discussing agape. God chose a word to talk about his kind of love, but the word he used was a Greek word that didn't mean what God meant. We're going to get into some of these things. It's all the Sabbath is going to tell us those things. The word eternal. We're finally getting to the subject of time. <laughs> the word eternal. When people use the word eternal, they're misusing it. I have never heard a Seventh day Adventist who uses it correctly. I'm sorry, even at the seminary level. It has to do with duration. We all know that. But it's concrete time. And most people have gotten around to that. They're, their spiritualism doesn't go far enough to get rid of it being real, real, really there. Eternity. But most of the world teaches that time, there's something wrong with it. It has to be done away with. Because Plato didn't like it. He said, pure spirit is timelessness. No time. What good is a spirit that has to have a watch? Pure spirit doesn't do that. Timelessness. Time must come to an end. That's what Plato teaches. Time must come to an end. And he says that time must be part of the creation. And if it's part of the creation, then it's no good. Time is just like your body. It's got to go. <laughs> it's evil. Well now, first thing we have to know is time is not evil. That's the first thing. Now this word eternal, what does this word eternal deal with? I wasn't going to do this, but I have to now. I backed myself into a corner. The eternal sun. People like to jump up and down and holler and hoot and say, well, there it is. What's wrong with you? It says he's the eternal sun. That means he's always. The word eternal does not mean always. That's the first mistake they make. The word eternal does not mean always. It means eternal. What does eternal mean? Let me use it. Eternal death. What does that mean? Eternal death. It never ends. The eternal sun means the same thing. He never stops being the sun. All of us here who are sons are eternal sons. How can you stop being a son? We are eternal sons. The, the ladies are eternal daughters. You you cannot stop being a daughter or a son. It just means you are always. That's you. You're, you're a son or a daughter. So eternal by itself, that word does not mean always. That's a terrible, 
horrible mistake that people make. But time to the pagans say there's something wrong with it. It's it's temporal. It's matter infected. And when all the creation burns up, time will be gone. And now we can go into eternity because eternity is different than time. Well, you know, the devil thought up a good one when he thought that one up because he knows the Sabbath is all about time. How can you have a seventh-day Sabbath without time? It's not possible. And Isaiah tells us that we are going to worship through all eternity from one Sabbath to another. Well, it's got to be measured somehow. There's got to be time. The whole idea is ridiculous. But people don't think. They just believe what the churches tell them. And the way the churches tell them is through the ministers. They just believe the ministers. And the ministers don't know any more than what they were told at the seminary. And the seminary learned it all from Sunday keeping books. I received an email this week that said our pastor this Sabbath is not going to preach. He's going to play a DVD of a Baptist minister preaching. And I wrote, he said, Mr. Ken, can he do that? So my only answer was, well, at least he's telling you where he's getting his sermons from. We are in tough shape as a people. We are in tough shape. And we don't realize how bad things have gotten. Well, time. Why does a sinner not like time? Well, it's either too long or it's too short. <laughs> Never happy with, with time. <laughs> sinner. Well, time is no good to the sinner. And neither is the Sabbath. Well, if the Sabbath is time, the creator of time must not be so good either. So if you keep taking this all the way back, you say that God himself has a problem. He made the seventh-day Sabbath. That's not, not right. That's not good. I don't like the seventh-day Sabbath. And people get themselves all confused about time because the pastors told them something. The church teaches something. They don't read their Bibles. They don't understand what the world Christianity really is. So they say, well... God doesn't is not in time. So it must not be important. If God doesn't live there, he's out there and we're here in time. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever thought it? They say God is not in time. That's a pagan thought. That is a pagan thought. Say, well, wait a minute. How could God be in time? Because in time you have a past and you, you have a future. They say God doesn't have a past. And they do all these reasonings. God doesn't have a past. And we even have a book on the shelves at the ABC called The Openness of God that says God doesn't know the future because it hasn't happened yet. That's an Adventist book by an Adventist philosopher. So called. By the way, I went to school with him. So I know where some of this stuff came from. Well, I want to ask you, is there a, t a place without time and space? Think about that question. Is there a place without time and space? No. Science has learned enough to know that they can't see far enough to know what's out there. They used to think there was about 2,000 stars out there, and now it's 3 billion on planet Earth, uh, in our galaxy, excuse me, <laughs> three, 3 billion stars in our galaxy, and who knows how many galaxies are out there. And with the Hubble, they saw further than they've ever seen, and they keep going out there. But they know there's more out there, because no matter how they keep multiplying the magnification, there's always something there! There's always something there! But, you know... We we like to think we're part of the intellectual, so we think, okay, but let's suppose we finally get to the end of it. Out there, there's this shell, and it ends, and now there's nothing out there. 
What kind of speculation is that? Haven't they been around long enough to know that no matter how far you go in any direction, there's always more. There's always more time. You cannot exhaust it. Why? That's the question. And people who can't ask the first question never get to the second one. Why? Because God is unlimited. He is unlimited in love. Now I know he's never thought that one through. He is unlimited in love. Does he have enough for you? Is it enough? Will he fail you because he doesn't love enough? Come on. God is unlimited in love. Now, let's sit you in a place where every philosopher has refused to go, but, and theologians too, the brightest ones, and there's been some really bright people putting up big ideas, you can hardly understand what they're saying. Here's the question I have for all of them. Is it possible to be without being somewhere? There's only one answer to that. <laughs> if, if you are, you are somewhere. And of course, if you're somewhere, you're there now, that's time. I won't get into what is time, the continuum of past, present, now. It's all a continuum. We won't get into all of that. We just want to know the basics here, that if I be, I be somewhere. That's simple. So, if God is, He is somewhere. You can never say God was nowhere. God is, so he is somewhere. Now, what is existence? He did create things that weren't. That's called creation. But the absolute millisecond that he made something, was it somewhere? Of course. How could he make it to be nowhere? So God, when he created, he created up the, them somewhere. It was already there because existence is space and time. You cannot have existence without space and time. It's always there. So God did not create space and time. He created creation. And space and time go along with it. So then, does God have time for you? What do I mean by that? Tonight at uh, 7 o'clock, 500, let's make it big, let's make it 3 billion people up pray. All at the same time. At uh, 7 o'clock tonight, 3 billion people are going to pray to God. Now how's it going to handle that? Well, if you're thinking that he's bound to the same kind of time we are, it can't happen. <laughs> How in the world is he going to connect that, that many times all at the same instant? But we have to remember, God is not timeless. That's the trap that pagans fall into. He is not timeless. He lives in unlimited time. No limitations. Just like he has unlimited love, he has unlimited time. He has time for you individually like there's nobody else in the universe. That's right. So on Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, for that 24 hours, he has time to spend every second of it with you as though there was nobody else. Are you beginning to catch on to what the Sabbath is supposed to be telling us? 
Let me give you an illustration of it. It was uh, C.S. Lewis, the first sentence that I know about, he got it from someplace else. But I don't believe everything C.S. Lewis does. He drops into spiritualism too, but he was a brilliant man. So he says this thing about time. Does it bother you? How does God do this? He says, well, we can't know all the particulars, but think about it this way. You're writing a book. And in this book, Mary, here's a knock at the door. And she starts walking toward the door to open the door. And you're writing this all down. Here goes Mary to the door. And all of a sudden, somebody knocks at your door, the real one. So you put down your pencil, you go to the door, you answer the door, somebody comes in, you talk for half an hour, the person leaves, and you say, well, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, I was writing that book. So you sit down again, you pick up your pencil, there was a knock at the door, Mary goes to the door, she opens the door, how much time has elapsed for Mary between the times the door knocked and she opened it? No time. In the story that you're writing, there was no time lost at all. But in real time, you were for half an hour talking to somebody. And both those things were happening at the same time. God, in his unlimitedness, can be with us our whole lifetime. As though there was nobody else. And do the same thing with this person. And do the same thing with this person. And do the same thing with this. Because he has the time. <laughs> he is not timeless. It's unlimited time, which is an opposite idea. Unlimited love. Okay, so the idea that God created time and space and he has nothing to do with it is a pagan idea that is preached everywhere in the world. And you can't do it if you believe in the Sabbath. Seventh day Sabbath. Because the Sabbath, the seventh day is concrete time and God kept it with us. When you say God has no past, that's not true. He came down to this earth and that sixth day of creation is part of his past, his unlimited time. He's part of history. Human history. But of course he's unlimited to human history. All right, we're beginning to see here that the Sabbath is trying to inform us about a lot of things. We have just a minute or two left here. Let's try to finish this. The problem with time, according to the brilliant ones, the intellectuals, the doctor's degree, is that time is always changing. And you have some changes for good and some changes for bad. Change, change is corruptible. And if God lived in time, that would mean he was corruptible. And that would mean he could change if he was in time. This is the way they're reasoning, this pagan reasoning. Time is inferior to eternity, according to them. So we have this sordid matter called time. But what they don't realize, since he's unlimited in time, is that there is room enough for God in time. No matter where he is, he is somewhere in time. So if we can understand that God is without limitations, it begins a little bit, to be a little bit easier to understand what the Sabbath is saying. Now, the Sabbath is telling us that God has a form. None of the Sunday keeping churches believe that. God has a form. He has a personality. He lives in infinite time. He has a real existence. He is a person. I, I have to say that over and over again. God is a person. His son is a person. How many persons does that make? Two persons. Not one trinity. Two persons. Each with their own personality. Each with their own Holy Spirit. 
When Jesus came here, He was the eternal Son, and He became the eternal Man, because He's never going to stop being a human. Never. So that means that human also is going to be in time forever, just like all reality. And Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to know that, is that Jesus is forever a human. How can they believe a human is going to live outside of time? That's nirvana. Jesus is in a human body forever. He's in eternity, which is unending time. Let me finish with this thought. When Adam was created sinless on the earth, did he live in time? He lived in time. When he became a sinner, he still lived in time. He had the Sabbath before he became a sinner. He had the Sabbath after he became a sinner. Is he going to have the, the Sabbath when he's redeemed in heaven? Yes, forever, eternally, in time. Everything in the Bible tells us the word eternal does not mean always. So the next time you talk to somebody and they say the eternal son means Jesus has always been, you better start helping them see the word eternity. The word eternal does not mean always. It just means forevermore. Father, we thank you that you have given us time to study, to learn, to hear your voice. To have a personal connection with you. We thank you that it comes through Jesus, through his spirit. May we keep making our minds and hearts open to your teaching. So that we can truly understand and we can know what we're looking forward to. So that we can be with you truly on the Sabbath. For the full 24 hours you've given us the privilege of having your fellowship. Bless us now as we try to share with somebody else. In Jesus' precious name.